So often, in the past ten years, I have had to prophesy evil. But now, a great weight is lifted from us. A great tension relieved. There's no danger of the exchange falling too far. The voice you're hearing is that of John Maynard Keynes. This is a rare recording of the highly influential early 20th century British economist known as the founder of Keynesian economics. British trade will have received an enormous stimulus. Keynes's novel lectures during his tenure at King's College, Cambridge, inspired economists and policymakers of the time and continues to do so a hundred years later. And our manufacturers and our unemployed to taste hope again. In today's podcast, we hear IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva deliver a speech that is inspired by one of those lectures to a young audience at the very same King's College. Uh, The inspiration for this uh, lecture came from John Maynard Keynes' essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. We know Keynes uh, studied and worked here. I just uh, visited the space where he worked. Uh, He became the father of macroeconomics. He is also one of the founders of the institution I'm so proud to lead, the International Monetary Fund. When he went to New Hampshire in 1944 for the creation of the two Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, He brought vision, courage, and optimism, an unwavering belief in the power of humanity to make lives better over time, despite setbacks caused by crises and wars. And this optimism shines in economic possibilities for our grandchildren. And this particular work has a very special place in my heart. Why? Because I think a lot about my grandchildren. And because I am an unwavering optimist, like Keynes, who even in 1930, in the dark days of the Great Depression, saw a brighter future. As in Casey's time, there are plenty of pessimists today. And with a little help from artificial intelligence, we can hear what Keynes said about Dunn in his essay. I predict that both of the two opposed eras of pessimism, which now make so much noise in the world, will be proved wrong in our own time. The pessimism of the revolutionaries who think that things are so bad that nothing can save us but violent change, and the pessimism of the reactionaries, who consider the balance of our economic and social life so precarious that we must risk no experiments. Well, Keynes actually projected that in a hundred years' time, living standards would be as much as eight times higher, driven by gains coming from technology and capital accumulation. And he was right. The massive leap in living standards is very close to what he predicted then. Looking that far into the future, of course, he didn't get everything right. He expected people to turn productivity gains into more leisure, but his projected 15 hours work week has never arrived. He was also too optimistic about how the benefits of growth would be shared. Economic inequality remains too high within and across countries. And yet, his key message about the long-term economic gains from technology and investment holds as true today as it did then. It is the foundation for a promise to be made to the next generation and to those who would follow. And it is about that. What can I do? What can we do to ensure that 
their generation will have a better life. Young people today, and you know it very well, face enormous challenges, uh, even in richer countries, from paying for education to finding work, to buying a home, to being deeply concerned over climate change and how it would impact your life. And it becomes easy to be pessimistic because many people, young and old, are feeling that the economy is not working for them. Uh, many are not just anxious, they are angry. For many, trust has eroded. And we see how this plays out uh, in society and in politics. Surely we do not want our grandchildren to live in an age of anger. And for that, we must be clear-eyed about the risks, but also seek and find the opportunities and then seize them. Bear with me, like Keynes, I want to take the long view. First, I want to look back. Over the past 100 years, the world has seen more progress for more people than ever before. Even as global population has quadrupled, per capita global income has risen eight folds. Over the past three decades alone, 1.5 billion people lifted themselves out of poverty and hundreds of millions have entered the middle class. A hundred years ago, people were fortunate to live into their 40s. Today, on average, they can expect to live into their 70s. We witness dramatic improvements in infant mortality rates, literacy rates, education levels, especially for girls. I mean, just look around and see how many girls are in this theater. Look at them. <laughs> So how did we get here? Two of the drivers of progress, technology and capital accumulation, worked just as Keynes predicted. People's lives and prospects were transformed by innovations, electricity, the internal combustion engine, antibiotics, indoor sanitation, communication technology. Many of those started in the 19th century and blossomed into the 20th century. Capital fueled investment in industry, agriculture and services. Public revenue gave us essential infrastructure from roads and ports to electricity grids and fiber optic cables. All of this has driven productivity and output growth, which has in turn bolstered the size of the economy. And on top of it came economic integration. Over the past 40 years alone, we saw a six-fold increase in global trade and a ten-fold increase in global capital flows. This has boosted productivity and investment, especially in emerging market economies. In my own country, Bulgaria, Per capita income has quadrupled since the fall of the Iron Curtain, mostly due to the opportunities from integration with the European Union and from global trade. And the number of countries on our planet has increased from about 80 to 193 countries today. A vibrant family of nations glued together, but what I call a special ingredient, international cooperation, ranging from coordination of economic policy, especially in times of crisis, to scientific discovery and cultural exchanges, to peacekeeping and space exploration. Cooperation has given us what many scholars call the post-1945 long peace, 
the absence of direct conflict between great powers. Put simply, the more we talk, the more we trade, the more we strive. And the world continued to change. Economic power has increasingly shifted to emerging and developing economies. This year, we project that these economies will account for almost 80% of global growth. But there have been also serious policy errors, especially a failure to do enough to support those hit hard by dislocations from new technology and trade. A failure to share the benefits of growth more widely. Some three quarters of the world's wealth today is owned by just one tenth of the population. And too many developing countries are no longer catching up with advanced economies. More than 780 million people face hunger. We have also learned that high levels of economic inequality have a corrosive effect on social capital and on trust in public institutions, in companies, in each other. And uh, we see that trust diminishing among nations too, with geopolitical tensions on the rise. Yeah, and if this trend is to continue, the world economy could fragment into rival blocks. Our research at the IMF shows that trade fragmentation alone could cause a global output loss of up to $7.4 trillion. We know from experience, Keynes uh, uh, wrote a lot about it, a uh, fragmented world is poorer and less secure. And we see the human tragedy that comes with that. We see it in uh, Ukraine. We see it resulting from the uh, Israel-Gaza conflict. And there are so many other terrible stories of conflict that don't make headlines, but hit hard on people. So what we know today is uh, a reversal to military spending up it was going down since the Cold War. We call this a peace dividend. This peace dividend is now gone, and the long peace may be at risk. And ironically, this is happening when we need, need each other even more. We need cooperation to tackle issues that are borderless, cannot be resolved by any country on its own. Climate change is the most glaring example. These are uh, very significant challenges, but at the same time, we can't just sit home and cry over the problems we face. We do have opportunities to pursue. And if the last 100 years are of any guide, we can be reasonably confident in our ability to achieve astonishing progress in the future. And when we add to this that we now have the clear understanding of what did not work in the past, we bring this in and we have agency, the power to change course. So, Imagine the world in the 22nd century, where everyone, regardless of race, color, creed, gender, or birthplace, has a fair shot to reach their full potential, where technology is put to work for the benefits of all, where people lead healthy and meaningful lives on a livable planet, and where countries work with, not against, each other. I look forward in days not so very remote to
to the greatest change which has ever occurred in the material environment of life for human beings in the aggregate. But of course it will happen gradually. Indeed, it has already begun. And it is in this spirit, it has already begun. I want to share with you two possible scenarios for the next hundred years that have been developed by IMF staff. Both assume no cataclysmic events, either because of actions of men or because of uh, nature. In what we may call the low ambition scenario, global GDP would be about three times larger and global living standards twice as high as they are today, low ambition. In the high ambition scenario, global GDP would be 13 times larger and living standards would be nine times higher. Why this huge difference? In the low ambition scenario, we assume the experience from the living standards in the 100 years before 1920 define our growth trajectory. And in the high ambition scenario, we assume the much higher average growth rates from 1920 onwards. Likelihood of the highest scenario, high, because we know that we see a acceleration of progress. So I believe that my granddaughter, Ivana, is going to be in a world of the high ambition scenario. Why? First, because her generation, your generation, will rely on a different kind of growth, more sustainable and equitable, more resilient, so countries can better navigate what is already a more shock-prone world. Second, because you will turbocharge what has worked for us. You will protect and enhance the sound macroeconomic fundamentals and financial stability we strive to achieve. And you will be much smarter than us on the issue of inequality. Third, you will sustain open trade as a major engine of growth and entrepreneurship as a major engine of innovation and employment. So our responsibility today is not to leave to you a runaway inflation, not to pile up debt and expect you to foot the bill and to overcome the weakest medium-term average growth in decades. So we have a job to do. Uh, we want at the IMF to play our role to help our members undertake fundamental reforms so they improve productivity and increase the agility, the sustainability, the resilience of their economies. And above all, all we have an obligation to correct what has been most seriously wrong over the last 100 years, the persistence of high economic inequality. Our research shows that lower income inequality can be associated with higher and more durable growth. We simply cannot get to the high ambition scenario for growth unless we foster a fairer global economy. In a world of abundant capital accumulation and accelerating technological change, prospects for my grandchildren will hinge on whether we can allocate capital to where it is needed most and will make the biggest impact. And on our ability to cooperate, to achieve progress and to share the benefits of it. So if we are to promote better, fairer growth, where should capital go? Well, what this allocation should be? First, it should go for the new climate economy. The climate crisis did not exist in uh, 1930, although the seeds of it 
were already planted with the rapidly growing reliance on fossil fuels. But today, climate shocks are hitting economies everywhere, from droughts, wildfires and floods, to the less visible impacts in areas such as supply chains and insurance markets. Last year was the hottest on record. Global temperatures are set to surpass the critical 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold. Pessimists can point to it. They can say humanity faces a disastrous reckoning. I see a different picture. Yes, unchecked climate change would be catastrophic. But if we take decisive policy action, especially in this decade, we can reach a carbon neutral economy. That is a promise we must make. It means mobilizing trillions of dollars in climate investments for mitigation, for adaptation, for transition. And pay attention to low-income countries. They contributed the least to global warming, but are suffering the most. They also face the greatest investment gap. It means addressing the terrible market failure that sees polluters damage our planet free of charge. The price of oil, coal, and gas must reflect the true cost to humanity, including the impact on our climate and on public health. Yet, uh, what do we see? Our analysis shows that explicit fossil fuel subsidies have surged to over 1.3 trillion. This alone is bad enough. On top of it, we know that these subsidies typically give the richest 20% of the population about six times more benefits than to the bottom 20%. <coughs> Direct assistance to vulnerable groups would be far better. Our research also shows that pricing carbon is the most efficient way to incentivize and accelerate decarbonization. And we have a long way to go. The average uh, price per ton of CO2 emissions today is only $5 a ton, way below the $80 a ton that we need by the end of this decade to get to where we should go. And of course, carbon price is uh, very important, but not enough. We need comprehensive policies to steer the world towards the new climate economy. We need also development finance to do its job. Multilateral development banks to step up. We at the IMF are stepping up. We have a new instrument, Resilience and Sustainability Trust, that allows us to provide long-term financing to our members that are vulnerable to climate shocks and need to take the transition. Now, we see that, I mean, I, I, I want to give uh, credit where credit, credit is due. We see that change is already happening. For every $1 spent on fossil fuels, $1.70 now goes on clean energy. This is compared to ratio one to one just five years ago. And we know that this is actually smart economics. Uh, more climate investments would create millions of green jobs, they would increase innovation, they accelerate uh, green technology transfer to developing economies, and they can break the historic link between growth and emissions. You grow, emissions go up. So countries get richer, people enjoy better living standards without hurting our planet. And that climate transition is a big, important part of moving toward a lighter economy more oriented towards intangible assets, such as intellectual property and experience rather than goods. Much more efficient and less wasteful, what some have called the circular economy. Uh, we don't know uh, uh, much about the future, but let me go to something that we do know. The second thing we have to speed up is investing in the next industrial revolution. I mean, the world economy 100 years from now, who knows what exactly it would look like, whether it would be on this planet or it would spread in the neighborhood. But one thing we do know, 
we know that innovation is accelerating. It is transforming the way we live, we work, we move, and the way we communicate with each other. From quantum computing to nanotechnology, from nuclear fusion to virtual reality, from new vaccines to gene therapy, we create miracles. Just recently, we managed to restore hearing in children with genetic deafness. Uh, and let's not forget, our work is quite interconnected. And that means that we can transmit knowledge with the huge potential of improving lives faster everywhere. Now, what is so wonderful about this conversation is it is happening in King's and in 1950, it was here in King's when Alan Turing published his fantastic transformative paper. And every decade since then has brought us forward, every step coming faster and being uh, bigger than the previous one. Uh, today, artificial intelligence is poised to reinvigorate the global economy. It is potentially a big bang moment. It could turbocharge productivity, which has been too low for too long. And we know that productivity, more than anything else, determines the long-term wealth of nations. But it does come with risks. Deep flakes, disinformation, potentially increasing inequality both within and across countries. So what is urgent is for countries to prepare to capture the benefits and to manage the risks. Scaling up investments in digital infrastructure, expanding access to training and retraining, setting up regulatory and ethical foundation for artificial intelligence. Uh, we have created an index of preparedness for AI at the IMF. I strongly recommend, look at it. We also identified the tsunami that is going to hit the labor markets uh, over the next years. 60% of jobs in advanced economies are likely to be impacted. Half of them may see benefits from artificial intelligence, but the other half may see artificial intelligence taking over more uh, human tasks that could drive wages down and destroy jobs. Keynes, in his time, warned about this uh, when he talked about technological unemployment. And I am uh, especially struck by AI potential if properly pursued to shrink the gap between rich countries and poor countries. Yes, to boost productivity, but also to shrink what differs from one place to another in human capital and help income levels catch up with those in advanced economies. And of course, that can only happen with international cooperation. So the third area of investment is in people. Greatest dividends are paid here, investing in health, in education, in stronger social safety nets, and empowering women. This lies at the heart of better and fairer capital accumulation. And nowhere is this clearer than in Africa home of the youngest and fastest growing population. By the end of this century, Africa's share of the global population is set to reach close to 40%. And on the opposite end of the spectrum are regions such as Europe, parts of Asia, where population is rapidly aging and even shrinking. We can make the opposites a track we can find a way to better connect Africa's abundant human resources with the abundant capital in advanced economies and in major emerging markets. How can we do it? How can we get flows in the right direction rather than having people from Africa running away from their homes to get capital to flow into Africa? Well, by improving macroeconomic fundamentals, the business environment, the tax capacity, the quality of spending. Uh, just one example from our research, low-income countries could boost their annual budget revenues by up to 
9% of GDP with prudent tax policies. And that big increase will create much more space to accelerate the economic development. And of course, uh, countries need to rely on predictable and uh, reliable international support. We have a critical role at the IMF. We are the insurer of the uninsured. Countries don't have their own resources. Re reserves, they have us. And uh, if we can combine the right kind of international support with the right kind of domestic policies, we can see Africa attracting long-term flows of investment, technology, and know-how. And this could unlock the full potential of its young people. The result, more jobs there, less outward migration, higher returns on capital there that can flow into the richer countries, help fund the pensions of the elderly population here. And overall, we can have a more dynamic uh, global economy. To, to put it very simply, a prosperous 21st century, a prosperous next years require a prosperous Africa. So let me get to my conclusions. I believe that investment in these three areas, climate, technology, and people, would define the path for the decades to come. But we cannot do it without cooperation. Keynes gave us a framework, a multilateralism for the 20th century. It served us well. Now we must update it for a new era. What would the 21st century multilateralism look like? Let me suggest the basic principles. It would be more representative with a better balance between advanced economies and the voices of emerging and developing countries. It would be more open and listening, not only to officials, but also to non-official voices, those of communities and social organizations based on common interests. It would be more results-oriented with more concrete deliverables, which would reinforce the benefit of cooperation, both economic and social. So updating this multilateral framework also means upgrading the institutions uh, that serve it, including the IMF. So I'm, I was trying to think, Keynes comes to the IMF today. I think you may be surprised uh, to see how much the IMF has changed in scale, in scope, and in character. Just since the pandemic, we have provided some $1 trillion of liquidity and financing to our member countries. We introduced programs for emergency financing and direct debt relief to our members. And our macroeconomic work now includes a focus on climate, on gender, on digital money, on artificial intelligence. We are the only institution in the world that is empowered to take the pulse to do health checks of the economies of our members, all of them, rich and poor, powerful and not so much. And then what we do is we translate this into policy advice to our members. We also recognize that we need to put in place better measurement of wealth that goes beyond the traditional GDP and values not only produce capital, but also nature, people, and the fabric of society. And I hope Keynes would approve of a global balance sheet that includes an expanded set of assets and recognizes the valuable services provided by the environment, the value of knowledge and ingenuity that is embedded in us and the value of good governance. And he may be astonished to see so many women at the IMF, including women in position of power. I think he would like what he sees, and he would encourage us to go even further as a global transmission line for sound economic policies, financial resources, knowledge, and as the ultimate platform for global economic cooperation. This remains the special ingredient. 
we cannot have a better world without cooperation. On this most fundamental of points, Keynes remains the authority. He was his right. Uh, so he's perhaps best remembered by something he wrote in uh, 1923. In the long run, we are all dead. <laughs> by which he actually meant the following. Instead of waiting for market forces to fix things over the long run, policymakers should try to resolve problems in the short run. It is a call for action, a vision of something better and brighter. And it is a call to which I, for one, am determined to respond, to do my part for my grandchildren. Because, as Keynes put it in 1942, in the long run, almost anything is possible. I so very much agree with him. Thank you, and thank all of you. That was IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva delivering a speech titled The Economic Possibilities for My Grandchildren at King's College, Cambridge, the birthplace of Keynesian economics. Go to imf.org to watch a webcast of the entire event that includes a conversation with King's College Provost Jillian Tett following the speech. And look for more IMF podcasts wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow us on X, what used to be Twitter, at IMF underscore podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>